Okay, good morning to everyone. You will notice um, that I am not Cameron Patterson, um, as is listed in your program, but I am Megan Clark, a product of Prince Edward County Public Schools, a proud product of Prince Edward County Public Schools, um, and a native daughter of this community. And so I am humbled and proud to be able to lead this panel discussion with three very influential individuals from our community. We have Mrs. Joy Cabarrus Speaks, Mrs. Bertha Early Shepherdson, and Mr. Floyd Bland here today. And we're going to talk to them a little bit um, about, in the time allotted for us, about Davis versus County School Board of Prince Edward County. And I will be honest with you all that I have only read excerpts of the case before last night. And I said, well, if I'm going to really understand the impact, I need to sit down and read the whole case. And the feelings that I had as I read that case let me know why I probably hadn't read it before. Because I was hurt, I was furious, um, sort of in a state of disbelief that people could really treat black folk in the way in which we, we had been treated. And I looked at some of the language of the court case and I chuckled to myself um, because in the case it says, of course, we need to have time and patience and a sympathetic understanding to why the school board did not want to integrate the schools. Um, as you all know, there was the mandate stating that schools had to be integrated, um, that the 14th Amendment um, due process equal protection laws stated that we had to integrate our schools. And Prince Edward said, no. And when I looked at the case, um, and of course it says that funding comes from the Board of Supervisors, and the Board of Supervisors says we're not funding schools that are integrated. And then it says that a passage of time does not automatically mean that the county is not being compliant with the mandate from the US Supreme Court that says integrate your schools. And so we have to have patience because it's something that people have to warm up to. And to read those words in black and white, no pun intended, to read those words in black and white where it says that basically we really weren't human beings and the amount of melanin in our skin dictated that we didn't deserve an education from, uh, from, from our public schools, it hurt like no other. And I didn't live it. These people lived it. And so I want to hear from you all really what it meant to be a named plaintiff in this case. What feelings did you all have and, and your family? And of course, you all were students at the time, and so your family had to back you in this decision. How did your family decide to allow you all to take part um, in a piece of history? Well, at the time I was living <clears throat> with my grandparents, and my grandfather had been very active in trying to get a new school for us, along with Oda Scott and others. Are you okay? No, it's on, just hold it up. Oh. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, at the time I was living with my grandparents and my grandfather was very active in trying to get a new school for us because of the deplorable conditions that we were going to school here at R.R. Morton, where we had no cafeteria, we had no science, um, it, we had no um, gym, we didn't have anything that the, the white schools had. Plus, we were overcrowded because the school was built for 180 people, and at the time that we went on strike, it was over 400. So when we went on strike that day, and Barbara and Carrie sent a letter to the NAACP, at first they did not want to take it, but then they accepted um, the letter from her and promised that they would come down later. Um, and on their way to Pulaski County, 
they decided to stop and fumble. But when they stopped, they said that they were not taking any other cases for new schools. It would have to be integration. And with the school to be integrated and go to court, you would, the parents would have to have property and they would have to sign for us because all of us were underage. And they decided once we had the mass meeting down at First Baptist Church, the parents decided to sign. My grandmother signed for me. Uh, my grandfather was very proud of it. And he felt that being that they had not accomplished what they were trying to do, that we would be able to do it and they would support us along with Reverend Griffin. <coughs> My parents were active members of the NAACP and, and they knew nothing about the walkout until we came home early from school that day. But they were very receptive to the idea and they worked with um, Reverend Griffin and the organizations involved to promote uh, school for us. At the time the schools closed, I had graduated and I had moved on seeking better employment. But my siblings were involved. You know, something's wrong with that microphone. We can't hear you out here. Other people can hear you in the back of me. And I'm sitting up front. Can you hear me now? Yeah. You know, what, what you were doing was fine. But, uh, Their voices are just a little slack. Right. I guess. Yeah. I've moved away from the uh, area and I worked for some years and upon returning to the area, I went to the employment office to seek employment and I was told that they asked what jobs I had had in the past, so I informed them, and they told me that the only thing they had to offer me was um, housekeeping and childcare. So I told them that I cleaned one house, and that was my mother's, and I lived there, and she made me, and that's all I was going to clean. So I didn't um, get anything through the employment office, but the principal at the school was on the governor's board of corrections at that time, and they were in the process of promoting minorities for those positions, and I interviewed, and that's where I went to work. <coughs> Excuse me. And I worked there for, I retired with 30 years service, and that was the only job that I had in this area. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We had been planning this walkout for some time. I did not tell my father anything about it. And the day of the walkout, when I went home, I told my father we had walked out of school. He did a whole bunch of flips. He was very protective of us kids. You're gonna get hurt, but I'm gonna get hurt along with you. So he was very supportive of us doing what we did. And he also was a member of the NACP a long time ago. So it was very disturbing to him at first because he figured that we might get hurt, which at times we did come under pressure. But all in all, we made good progress, and my father was very supportive of me doing so. Mr. Bland, you mentioned that um, at times you all came under pressure. So I imagine that when you all heard that schools had to be integrated, you felt excited. Tell us a little bit about, and, and trying to get the feeling for the community um, at the time that the mandate came that schools had to be integrated. 
tell us a little bit about what the feelings were like in the community from non-blacks when that happened, because clearly it didn't happen the way that we all envisioned it should happen. Well, the, the, well, when we did walk out of those, it was, what, it's been uh, 68 years since we walked out of those back steps right there. The other communities, people in other communities, they were kind of shocked that we as kids would take that courage to walk out of school. So therefore, they actually, it was some serious times when we did. We, we used to have a meeting right here, walk down the street to the courthouse after we had a meeting, sing on fire, because other people would come across the street to see that we did not block the street. So that was kind of, you know, kind of harassing us a little bit. But we, with Reverend Griffin, we did what we supposed to do and we, did not start any disturbance, so we didn't have any problem once we walked down the street in single fire. But it, it was some serious times here in Prince Edward County. And were any of you all, um, Ms. Shepherson, I know you said that you finished school and you moved away by the times the schools reopened. Um, is that correct? When they closed. When they closed, okay. Um, Mr. Bland and Ms. Speaks, were you all still here when schools reopened? No, I had graduated in 1955 and I had moved away. So I was living in New York at the time and then I moved from New York to New Jersey. No, I... Uh once, once I graduated in 1952, I was called into the military, so I was not here when the school closed. Of course, you all have all moved back here now, and so I want to know a little bit about what made you all come back to the area, um, and if you were able to see a change when you came back? Yes, I returned, I did not return back to Virginia until 2007. So naturally I did see a change that had been made and some progress that had been made. And also that um, a lot of the people within the community were trying to be more, um, they, they wanted to show that they were sorry for what they had done. That was some of them, but some people still felt the same way that they did in 1951 and in 1959 when they closed the schools. Uh, Ken Woodley had gotten, um, gone to the Board of Supervisors and got, um, plaque that's put in the courthouse uh, showing their regret. But we still, when you look at the year of 2019, it seems as though we are going backwards. It's still, we are confronted with the same things that we were confronted with in 1954, as far as schools, jobs, and everything else. When I returned, uh, poll tax had been discontinued, but when you went to the courthouse to pay your taxes, they still tried to add that poll tax into it. And um, it was always a debate. I didn't see a lot of change once returning. When did you go back to Dakota? Uh, 63. Can you tell me more about what you hadn't seen change? Well, the schools were, hadn't integrated that much because they had opened a uh, school for the uh, white children. And from what I can understand, that our 
tax money was issued for them to attend that school. And as usual, you know, we didn't um, receive our tax money for that purpose. After being away for 22 years, when I came back to Prince Edward County and walked down the street in Farmville, I thought I was in another place. Everything had changed. The things I couldn't do when I left, I could do when I came back. So it was surprising to see how one county could change overnight. I mean, I'm saying overnight. It didn't change overnight, but it changed. So, and I was very, very happy to see that. Just one moment. A Toyota vehicle with Virginia license plate VST6335 is blocking the caterer's truck. If it's yours, could you please remove it? So it seems as though you all came back at different stages of Prince Edward's development. Uh, Ms. Shepherdson, it sounds like you came back earliest, um, not a lot of progress. Um, Mr. Blaine, you came back next, was, seems like it was night and day. Um, and then Ms. Speaks, you came back, um, and it seems as though there were changes, but you can still see some of the undertones of what happened to you all um, back in the 50s. So that sort of leads to the next point. Some people, I mean, I think I was discussing it with um, Cam earlier. Some people went to their graves believing that they made the right decision and that they made the right decision in closing the schools and not integrating. And now that you all are here and you've been here for some time, do you think that our school system still has that stigma attached to it. Um, and do you think that it's now Fuqua, which used to be Prince Edward Academy, do you think that it can stand on its own not acknowledging this history? Do you think that the schools have progressed in a way in which the history is there and we recognize that that history is there, but that they are now separate and apart from that history. Uh, well, as far as Fuca, the school, Fuca School, a lot of the students come to the museum and they try to relate and understand what happened in 1951, 1959, and why it happened. And even when we went into the case of the Brown versus the Board of Education, when they went into the five cases, um, Robert R. Morton, being uh, student-led, we had more plaintiffs than anyone else in the case because we had 177 plaintiffs where others had five or whatever. So uh, they, <clears throat> they understand what we did and why we did it. So I think more people are becoming um, more aware and want to learn more about it. And I think that a lot of them want to try to prevent it from happening going forward. But you still can find some of the stigma still, even in Prince Edward High School, as far as the gifted and special needs and everything, you still see there's, um, some segregation when it comes to that. I see the two schools as being two separate entities altogether because if it wasn't for the fact that they could get tax breaks, they would not be the way that it is today. When, okay, when I first came back, it was still some the thinking that we should be separated. It was that. That's one organization that I knew of. When I came back to join that organization, they wanted 
recommend to me to another organization, which all of were the same thing. So they were t- still trying to separate people from different people. So that's one change that they hadn't changed. And you can see it right today. It still hadn't changed. <laughs> You all have hit a point um, where I think that the community all, we want to try to move forward, but I don't think that we can move forward without understanding um, our history. And it helps us to understand why Prince Edward County is the way it is. And recently, um, a member of our Board of Supervisors said, it's time that we get over it. And mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and that lets me know that we still have so far to go. Because if this individual in 2019 says, just get over it, it happened, let's move on. It lets me know just how much people don't understand the impact that this can have on not just the people who were directly affected, but generations to come and the community as a whole. So if someone says, well, just get over it, how, what should the response be? Um, you know, how do you all think that we can move forward and what do you think still needs to change? It sounds as though we still have um, segregation, whether it's self-segregation or whether it's institutionalized and it's just there. So how do we continue to teach about our history and continue to try to progress from it? What do we need to do as a community? Well, I know um, at one of our council meetings, I was um, told the same thing. You should just get over it and move on. And I explained to that individual that you can't forget about it. It happened, it's always gonna be there. You are saying to get over it because you have not experienced what we have experienced. You haven't been hurt the way that we've hurt and you haven't been neglected the way we have. So we can't just move on and forget about it. We can try to move forward and make things better, but we will not forget. I don't know the, I don't have the answer as to what to do because at this point it seemed to have been so hard to reach that point where it can be one, uh, one unit. Because when my daughter was ex- uh, selected, accepted for school, her counselor told her, we'll see who has the last laugh now. And with that attitude, I think that we're still in that era. Was that in Prince Edward? Hmm. Was that in Prince Edward? Yes. There is no way that you can forget what happened in Prince Edward County. The impact that what happened in Prince Edward County will last until we leave this earth, period. You might move forward, but it's going to be a long process. It's always going to be in the mind of people what happened in Prince Edward County. All we can do is try to work together and better our community. Because what happened in Prince Edward County still has an effect on Prince Edward County. A lot of people right here now did not get an education on account of what happened in Prince Edward County. So all we can do is try to work together and move forward and correct the situation. But there's no such thing as forgetting it, period. No. I think that a part of not forgetting, because I absolutely agree, you you can't forget it. It, You just can't. Um, And it's not something that you just get over. Um, Part of it is that I think we all need to be more educated about what took place. Um, I have a friend who is an adult in her 30s, and she went to Fuqua. And she did not learn about what happened 
in her own home until she went to VCU and took a class and they discussed Prince Edward County in that class. And she became physically ill and had to leave um, her class because of course she was overcome with emotions about what took place here, but also that it had never been discussed among her classmates, among her family. Um, and so she was a bit taken aback that she could live here and be so ignorant on that particular topic. Um, and so in looking at things, um, did you all ever, in your, when you came back or, or in your dealings, have you all ever had any dealings with anyone who was on the school board or board of supervisors when the schools were closed? No? And what was that like? Um, well, I had um, yeah, a conversation with one that was involved during that time, Howard Simpson. He has since passed. But he wanted to lead me to believe that he was doing so much to help the blacks. Although I know that during that time, they all had voted to not uh, put in appropriate any money to keep the schools open. And I know that there was mass resistance when we went on strike and the decision was handed down versus the, uh, Brown versus the Board of Education that it was unconstitutional. Um, so they did nothing to try to uh, be in compliance with the court or anything else. And I think that they felt that what they did was the right thing to do because there was prejudice and they did not want to see. They felt that as long as you stayed in your place and did what they felt you should do, that was sufficient. So. And now, sometimes with the Board of Supervisors, they still come up with uh, statements as far as saying that they weren't going to appropriate any more money to the museum, which was corrected because it was only one person that had made that statement. But I don't think we will ever see a world that there's no prejudice. Unfortunately, I think you're right. Um, and unfortunately, I think that our color, the color of our skin will always matter. And I've come to accept it. Um, I do not like it, but I have come to accept it and I realize that I have to work, um, I have to work differently because of this. And I can't really put into words the feelings that I have that our county, the county in which I sit, the county in which I serve, thought that the white students were going to be, I mean, it was almost as if they thought that we were going to kill them, <laughs> that we were these animals, these savages, that there was nothing that we could ever offer to education um, and into the educational process um, other than just things that just repulsed them. And to think that they thought that about us blows my mind. Um, and I, I will leave it at that. But do we have any questions from any members of the audience about for our panelists um, or about the Davis decision? Yes, sir. I often wonder if we're doing enough. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the questions I had uh, during the tour was, uh, should we insist or should we talk more about making it mandatory that children in the counties that were affected know this history? Can everyone hear? Talk through this, 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 this museum. And sir, what's your name? I'm sorry, Mr. Dr. Turner. Dr. Turner. Turner, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if everyone could hear, but it's should we make this mandatory that people, especially in the counties that were affected, learn about this history? Um, I, I will let our panelists answer, but I think absolutely. And I think that we um, have done some of that legwork, and I think that 
probably Kane and is in the best position because it's on the Virginia standards of learning. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know whether we're doing any good because this is a sickness. It's a sickness. And I don't, I don't know whether it's fatal or not, but it, it, it appears to be fatal. But I, I, I still think we should try to do a little bit more, even through this fatal attraction. I really do feel that that, that, that is fatal. Um, I, I feel that it should be mandatory that everyone within the county knows what happened. And as um, Megan said prior, Canaan would be the best one to speak on that because every day he's educating the visitors, students, come from all different schools and everything to learn about the story of the children of courage. And Mr. Townsend, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is included on the Virginia Standards of Learning. Is that not correct? Yes, fourth and eleventh grade. Okay. So fourth and eleventh grade, I don't know um, who lives in Virginia anymore and who doesn't, but all public schools have um, standardized testing, and that's the Virginia SOLs, the Standards of Learning Tests. And it is fairly new, but Brown v. Board, the story of Barbara Johns is included on those SOLs now. So that is a step. It may not be where we ultimately need to be, but it's a step in the right direction. Yes, sir, in the back. So the question for our panelists is, did you find things different when you left in terms of, um, you said social settings, yes. um, and as well as with school systems, and in your dealings when you moved away, were things different from Prince Edward? I think it's like any other area that you live, you have your groups, the money will go depending on the population in that area. And then you have the areas that you don't get funding. So it's really not that much difference. Were schools integrated where you were? They were, but it was mostly according to the neighborhoods. Okay. You said nothing. So I'm hearing that race relations may not have been all that different where you were. Um, and even though schools were to be integrated, schools um, were based on neighborhood. And so if you lived in a black neighborhood, you went to school with others who looked like you. Okay. Was there another question? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Yolanda Vigor Black. Um, I'm just interested if we are not, I'll say as a teacher, especially as a black um, nationality, if we're not interested in education, we'll never really know what the effects of all of Brown versus the board and everything that happened in our community and spread out into other communities. I have a granddaughter that's now in the 10th grade in um, Florida, in um, West Palm Beach, Florida. In her seventh grade civics um, session, she, it came up the subject of Brown versus the Board of Education. And Zamari was the teacher for the day. They were so amazed to see a young lady that it affected her grandmommy and her great grandmother to be able to stand up to tell the class this story. Um, in the interim, Zamari was able to go do her county with the principal and the um, mayor at that time to stand up and tell the class the story. Um, in the interim, Ms. Martin was able to go do her county with the principal and the 
um, mayor at that time to just expel a little on what happened here and to be a representative of her clan from right here in Virginia. So I say even in New York and places that I've been, if we don't search for our history, it's going to be lost. It's more to it than just what happened with segregation and being prejudiced. We didn't create the words. We, words were created long before many of us were born. And they were really created by white German and white other people in the European nations. And so if you're not searching for your history, you won't know about it. You, know, you won't really get it. the different societies. Like I was just listening to PBS the other evening. And according to um, what's it, um, Mitt Romney and Trump and some of these other guys, the judges that are on the Supreme Court, they are in what's known as the, the um, socialist society. So if you're not in these big groups or certain groups or sects that really lays out the lands of the law and or select the people that they have for you to vote for to suppress a lot of what we're talking about here. A lot of our history will always be here from us as long as you can't read. Okay, we don't want you to know what that is. And it's not going to be taught in the schools in your area because of the fact that we have powers that be. The burning machine down in Richmond was the, really the big poncho at the time when the school was closed. They were sitting in meetings and little tables just like this. We don't want those folks to go to school. So if you know the names of the people, you can follow their history, and then you'll know exactly what societies created what. A lot of things that we think that are cults and that are bad, if you don't have an idea of what it is, you won't know what it is and how it affects you through that. Thank you. I think that one of um, one of the issues that a lot of people, and I'll even say in my generation, and then those younger than me, is that oftentimes people want to believe that race no longer matters. And you go to different places, um, and I've even had a principal, not at Prince Edward, but another school say, well, we don't see color. Yes, you do. Uh, and, and to say that you don't see color because, you know, we were asking about diversity and not just diversity in terms of race, but um, in terms of ethnic backgrounds, in terms of people with challenges or disabilities. What, how do you define uh, diversity? And she says, well, we don't see color. You absolutely do see color. And even if you don't think that you see it, you see it. And it is something that is so ingrained into our society. And so I have people my age and younger um, who have children trying to say or trying to teach their children, well, I don't want them to see color. Um, and I think that that's almost doing a disservice to our young folks because it is something that they're going to have to deal with whether they like it or not. And so I think that we need to prepare them. And we need to, you know, not necessarily dwell and, and have negative connotations associated with your, this, your skin tone and where you're from, but we need to uplift and speak with them and just be very real with them. And I think that we have to be very real with people. And oftentimes I think people thought that once we had Barack in the White House that we'd made it. And now we're seeing that that's not the case. Um, that, that was a step in the right direction, but we've taken about 20, 30 steps back at this point. And so we have to be real. And in being real, the, what happened to you all has to be told. And being real, we have to look at how it has impacted you all and your families and my family. Um, and, and we have to, to have real discussions about it. Um, and I said to Mr. Bland this morning, I said, I never knew that you were one of the plaintiffs. I didn't know your story. Um, and I was so excited to see you up here um, because you just never know that you're walking amongst heroes right in your very community, right in, in your back door, and you just never know. So on that, any more questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. I have a question for you. Do you know what, it, what might be most helpful in your own families or in families of the other strikers for their children and descendants, you know, because it has had such an impact over the years. What do you think would be uh, most helpful to descendants of the strikers now? Helpful in terms of? You know, I don't know, what the, what, whether it's educational opportunity or scholarship or, I don't know. So I don't want to know what they feel about that. 
well, I think one good thing is scholarships because it uh, affords them to continue into higher education. And the more education you have, the better you are exposed to learning and understanding um, what's going on and how it's affecting your community or your family whatsoever. And also because back uh, when the schools were closed, the black families still paid taxes. They had to pay taxes, but they did not have a school to go to. And when the parents signed the plaintiff, they had to have prop property. Because if you did not own property, you were not able to sign for your child to be a plaintiff because all of us were underage. So I think it's a double standard with any way that you look at it because in order to keep them maintaining the status quo that they want. Because even when you look at the situation that happened recently with the parents that were paying money to get their children into the, the schools, you know, paying a half a million dollars and all that, and wherein the black students could not compete. A lot of them were not accepted in those universities because they were given to people that were being paid to be able to go into it. So it's always a double standard. And I think it still is, Nan, I think it will always be. Well, there is a program in progress, a scholarship program, to help those students, they were affected by the school closing. So that is a plus there, right there. And there is also a scholarship that's given um, from the fam Moten Family Challenge, and that's to go to um, children or grandchildren of the descendants that were affected by the school closing. So uh, that, in another way, helps the families to be able to send their descendants to college that, in other words, they would not be able to go. And right now, we have six students in u different universities that we have afforded them with a scholarship that's a $2,500 merit base uh, renewable scholarship. So that goes a long ways with the families. You know, I think we're dealing with, unfortunately, some generational curses that have to be dealt with um, because you're dealing with um, individuals who did not have the means to send their, um, their children to schools elsewhere. So you're dealing with people who had large lapses in their education. Um, you're dealing with people who some went back to school, others did not, and they're part of what we call our lost generation here because they did not go back to school. They were so close to adulthood. And so when you have that, then your earning potential um, decreases. And so you're dealing with um, being at a lower socioeconomic status. And I come from a family where each generation has wanted to see the generation after it do better. Um, you know, my grandparents said they wanted my parents to do better than them. My parents said that they wanted, you know, me and my sister to do better than them, and so on and so forth. But you're dealing with, we're working already, in reality, behind the eight ball because of our race. Then you're working further behind because we haven't been afforded the educational opportunities that are guaranteed to us. And so we've had to continue to, to try to break those chains that have held our families for so long because the opportunities were not here for us. And so it's going to take time. It has taken time. Things have gotten better. But we still have so much further to go, um, which sometimes can be disheartening because you want to say we have made it, we've done it. Um, but I, I say I'm a realist, some say I'm more of a pessimist, but I'm a realist in knowing that there is so much more that has to be done. 
Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And so I want to end on this note. Um, of course, we'll never get over it. It didn't even happen to me, and I can't get over it. You'll never forget. But have you all forgiven what was done to you? And if so, how did you get to a place of forgiveness? I got to a place of forgiveness because I feel that as long as you go through uh, the world day by day hating, uh, you will not be comfortable yourself. So in forgiving them, you are forgiving yourself also, and that makes you a better person. Well, okay, it's... It's no forgiveness, actually. People apologize. There's no such thing as apologizing. That's just an excuse to cover up. I must say, what we did here in 1951 did not only affect the students, it affected our parents also. Because if our parents were supporting us and working for a company, once they found out, they were terminated, period. Simple as that. And again, the parents that had students could send to another county, they would have to have two homes, one in the county they went to school with and one back home. And that cut down on your 
economy for the parents. So how are you, how are you going to forget and forgive something that's that terrible? I can't. I go wrong with it, but I do, do not accept the apology. And I respect that. Um, both, both of um, the statements that were given, um, I respect it and I receive it. And I thank each of you all for being here. I thank each of you all for having courage. I cannot imagine going home and telling my daddy that I had just walked out of school and didn't know what was going to happen next. Um, but it's because of you all that others in Prince Edward County have been able to receive an education. And so I do thank you very much. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Thank you, panelists. We indeed want to thank all of you for being out with us this morning. Our thought behind this panel was to get comments from people who had actually been named plaintiffs in Brown, to see how Brown affected them, to see how they reacted to the reactions of the county to Brown, to see how in their mind's eye they ever dreamed that the county would ever close its public schools as a result of a lot of that accomplished today. Because once you set things in motion, other things do happen. Things that you might not have even anticipated things that you might not have even dreamed of happen. I am appreciative of all of them. When I called Brother Bland, he was excited about coming. Although the members of his lodge, Brother Bland is the master of the local Elks Lodge. And all of the brothers at the lodge says, I don't believe he's coming, Mr. G. He never wants to talk to us about it. I said, Brother Bland said he's coming. And it's amazing that after all of those things that he's been through, he is still a exemplar in the community, master of the Elks Lodge, has put in his time, and still speaks highly of the experience and exposure that he has gone through. We have known Ms. Shepherdson for a long time, but Ms. Shepherdson has always been quiet, not wanting to speak up, not wanting to be out front. And yet, every Democratic committee meeting or NAACP meeting, Ms. Shepherdson is there as the supporter, as the person being committed but not wanting to be out front. Now, we knew Ms. Speaks was out front all the time, everywhere, and it's helpful to have at least one vocal person among the panelists. We indeed do appreciate all that they have done this morning. You know, it takes courage sometimes to come forward to talk about something that you think is embarrassing. Okay. And as a result of closing of public schools, a lot of people affected by it might have been embarrassing to come out to speak on it. We're going to continue, though, today with a luncheon speaker right here. That luncheon speaker is going to focus on the reaction of the Commonwealth to Brown. What did the Commonwealth do as a result of the Brown decision? And we think that's going to be quite an interesting discussion. Our speaker is going to be a professor from Longwood. And hopefully all of you will stay with us for that. This afternoon, we're going to have a panel on people who were directly, directly affected by the closing of public schools. People who either didn't go to school or left the community or moved other places 
and what their life was like during that period of time and how they have overcome that and what they are now doing as positive commitment to their community. This evening, we're gonna have dinner over at the Nance Room at the Doral Dining Hall on Longwood. And at that time, we're gonna have a discussion on Griffin versus County School Board of Prince Edward County. Griffin was handed down May 25th, 1964, in which the United States Supreme Court said, if public schools do not operate in Prince Edward, they, can, uh, they cannot operate anywhere in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Because not providing public education for students in Prince Edward was a denial of their equal protection of the law. And we're gonna have a discussion on that. Hopefully we'll have some of the plaintiffs in Griffin involved in that. I know we're gonna have Ms. Eva Bland there. Eva Allen Bland's family, I believed, filed about five or six court proceedings between 1955 and 1965 trying to get public schools desegregated and or reopened. Uh, the litigation that has involved Prince Edward is voluminous. There must have been at least 15 different federal court cases involving public education in Prince Edward even after public schools were reopened, the litigation continued. Okay. So we're gonna have that discussion this afternoon, this evening. Tomorrow, we're gonna have a intergenerational panel. People who were affected by the closing of public schools and either their son or daughter with them to talk about how the closing impacted their parents and their children to see whether or not this problem continues or how the impact continues to affect people. We believe we're gonna have a great weekend. All of this is open to the public at no charge, even the good breakfast that you had this morning. We believe that if we don't observe our history, no one else will. If we don't tell our story and toot our horn, no one else will. If we don't tell the story, it will be lost for generations. You know, the Jewish community always said, next year, Jerusalem. Regardless of what they had gone through, next year, Jerusalem. Because if I could get to Jerusalem, I could get to the temple. If I could get to the temple, I could do my religious observance. We believe that if we don't continuously keep our situation in mind, there won't be anybody saying next year Jerusalem for us. And we need to make sure our story is never forgotten. We want to make sure people across the world understand and appreciate the 
sacrifices we here in Prince Edward County made toward saving public education. As most of y'all know, public education is the tool by which we socialize America. There is the idea by people going to public schools, regardless of their religion, their sex, their race, their nationality, they become part of the melting pot. And public education is used for that socialization process. What a difference it would be in our world today if we did not have that public education, as bad as it may be in some places, as horrible as we don't think it's doing its job, it's still the tool which provides us the glue to make us Americans. We here know that all of our people have paid a great sacrifice and that we want to honor them remember them, and make sure they are never forgotten. As a result thereof, we've put this observance together for the weekend. We are so glad that all of you have come out and have been a part of it and will continue to be a part of it. Uh, the Moton Museum and the Prince Edward branch of the NAACP uh, enthused about this opportunity to join forces to make this possible. Um, we look forward to seeing all of you. And at this time, we'll just break. You can observe the galleries of the museum, and we will reassemble right in this room at noon for our luncheon. Any questions? Turner, I knew you had something. You doing what? As, as, as you were talking, I'm thinking about the stain, the stain that that happens to Brownville and Charlottesville. Uh, does the stain last forever? Does does uh, when 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 a city like Charlottesville will close the schools? When they make a big decision that has something to do with race. Or farm bill. Because in the back of your mind, the stain of closing the school and, and letting children go wherever they go. Does the stain last forever? Well, you know it's hard to get rid of the sore. The sore might heal, and as a result of the healing, there's still going to be a scar. We don't know whether or not the consequences of the scar would be large, small, or almost undetectable. But we know that it happened. Uh, I would think the way one deals with the stain determines the length of its longevity or whether or not it becomes not as harsh as it would have been if you didn't do anything. So I would think the way you react to the stain might determine whether it's going to be there forever. But something's going to be there. The, the question there is the degree of the stain. But it's going to be there. We can't, the stain of the Civil War is still with us. Okay? We can't wipe it out. But we know that in a lot of places, it's not as prevalent as in some places. But it's still there. So it depends on how one deals with it. Um, we have heard some 
of our panelists today talk about the reconciliation that the Board of Supervisors adopted. Okay? We've heard them also talk about the, uh, what's the word that the legislature used? Uh, regret, what? Uh, profound. profound regret, profound regret passed by the legislature. So there are actions which people take to deal with the stain, to make the stain less outstanding as it would be if you didn't deal with it at all. This lady asked earlier, what could we be doing now? What would people affected by what we've been through in Prince Edward might want others to be doing or doing themselves? You know, I believe part of our continuing problem is the lack of discussion. Uh, I believe that if people got together and talked, they would make a vast difference in dealing with any issue. In my younger day, we used to have a dinner group here in Farmville. There would have been a, some black people, there would have been some white people, there would have been some people who were old line Farmvillians and some people who were new to Farmville, some people who were connected to Longwood, some people who were not connected to Longwood. And we met at each other's homes once every quarter just to get to know each other, just get to understand each other, to talk about issues that we had grown up with, okay? To talk about what's happening with you, what's happening over there, so that we could get a better understanding, a better feel for who we are and what we were becoming as a community. I'm not sure of how many other places might have little dinner parties, dinner groups, where people of different backgrounds, different occupations, different religions. We even had a Muslim family who participated in our dinner parties because we knew that if something came down in Farmville, we would need to be able to reach out to all parts of the community to see what we could do. I believe the more we talk to each other, the more we talk about race with each other, the more we're going to be able to deal with race. Reverend Williams last night said that W.E.B. said, the issue of color, race, was going to be the dominating discussion in the 20th century, in the 21st century, until we actually are able to become what Ms. Clark says she doesn't believe, colorless. society. <laughs> we want to again thank all of you and we believe that Turner's question was the only one. Thank you all. We're going to get back together at noon for lunch. Right here.